Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your saints, as we have just now heard once again the account of our Lord Jesus Christ's birth in the flesh, according to St. Luke's Gospel, one thing that stands out, at least about the first seven verses or so, is just how plain it all is. It's quite ordinary, after all. Joseph has to travel to his ancestral home so that he can be counted in a census of all things, so that he can be taxed. He takes Mary with him, his betrothed wife, who was with child, in fact, who is so far along with child that while they are in Bethlehem, the time comes for the baby to be born. And then St. Luke writes, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. It's also ordinary. The only thing that really stands out is the poverty of it all. There's no room in the inn, perhaps because there were many descendants of David filling up all of the rooms of Bethlehem that evening and that week. Other folks to be registered for the same census of Caesars. No room in the inn, of course, but there is vacancy out in the cattle shed outside, and so Mary gives birth there, just as any other woman would. She swaddles the newborn to keep it warm, just as any mother does. She lays the child in a manger because, well, you work with what you've got. It's all fairly ordinary, with the exception of the extreme poverty of it all. To the world, this looked like any other birth. To everyone else in Bethlehem that evening, for this census, there was nothing extraordinary about this situation whatsoever. But not so for Mary and Joseph. They knew precisely what was happening because God had told them. On a spring day, the previous, uh, the previous spring, perhaps on the first day of Passover, the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary. She gre the angel greeted the Virgin. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. He went on to say, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is no ordinary child after all. He will be great. He will be called son of the highest. And the highest, of course, is God because there is no one more highly exalted than God himself. And although he would be the son of God, the angel says this child would also be fully man, bearing your flesh and mine, because he will be given the throne of his father David, son of the highest, yet son of David according to the flesh, true God and true man. Sitting on David's throne, he will reign over God's people into eternity. There will never be an end to his kingdom, because he is the eternal Son of God, begotten from the Father from all eternity. And when Mary then asks on that day, how can this be, because I have not known a man, the angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. It's not the union of man and woman that will conceive this child. But the Holy Spirit overshadowing the Virgin, so that something that has never before happened in history and will never happen again, then occurs. The Virgin conceives, as the prophet foretold, and the child in her womb is the Son of God. Mary understood this, and so did Joseph. Joseph, when he initially discovered that his betrothed wife was pregnant with child, well, St. Matthew describes him as a just and righteous man, and so he sought to put her away, to divorce her quietly, to shield her from public shame. But St. Matthew in his gospel tells us that an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph, too, knew that this child was no ordinary child, even though this child was not his, that it was conceived by God the Holy Ghost. He takes Mary as his own, 
cares for her and the child as well because of who this child is. You will call this name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. For that is what Jesus means, saving. This child is the promised Messiah, the Christ, the one whom God had promised to the very first sinners in the Garden of Eden, Adam of Eve, countless centuries ago. This child will be the Son of God and the Son of Man and will come specifically to earn the forgiveness for the sins not only of Adam and Eve, but for the sins of all of the descendants of Adam and Eve who have come since then, every sin that man has ever committed, so that all who believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. Mary and Joseph knew these things. They treasured them in their hearts. They pondered them. They believed them. And that's why they endured all of this as God's will. But the rest of the world sat in darkness about this child, imagining that it's just any other birth. There's nothing special or extraordinary about it. And so the Lord once again sends out his angel into the world to proclaim not just the birth of a child, but the birth of the Son of God in human flesh. And so this angel of the Lord appears to lowly shepherds who got stuck working the night shift outside of Bethlehem that night. This angel appears to humble shepherds because of what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. St. Paul describes the way that God works among us in the world. He says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. And so for a humble child of humble birth, in humble circumstances, this angel of the Lord appears to humble and lowly shepherds in all of the glory of the Lord. And they are greatly afraid. And who wouldn't be if the angel of the Lord appeared to you in great glory, in all of the glory of the hosts of heaven? Because when angels appear to sinners in glory, sinners have no choice but to bow their heads because of their sin, because of their unrighteousness. We can only be terrified when a messenger of God shows up because we fear by nature that when God shows up, he shows up in wrath and condemnation and judgment for what we deserve, for what we have done. But not so on this evening. There is no wrath. There is no judgment. There is no condemnation. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. The shepherds began greatly afraid, but their great fear is replaced with words of great joy. For to you is born a child in this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And so the child is born, not just in Bethlehem, but they say in the city of David, because this child is David's heir and David's son, just as Gabriel had told Mary at the Annunciation, the one who would rule over an eternal and everlasting kingdom. The child born is a savior, just as the angel had told Joseph in the dream, you shall call his name Jesus, because he has come for the purpose of saving his people from their sins. The child born is Christ the Lord. Christ meaning anointed, Messiah, the angel gives them the shepherd, not just this fantastic news, but then shows them the sign by which they will see all of this to be true for themselves. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Of all the signs you could give to point to God in human flesh, of anything that we may choose to say, that's the sign that I want to see from God, he again chooses the foolish and the weak. He again chooses the base and the things which are not, and the lowly and the humble. The poverty of it all is the sign by which the shepherds will know that this child is the child who is the son of David and the son of God. The strips of cloth used to swaddle the child will show them that this is the long-promised Savior from their sins. They aren't to look in the inns, they aren't to look in palaces, they aren't to look in guest houses or any place else you may expect to find such a child. They are to look in a cattle shed where you would find a manger. The poverty, 
the lowliness of it all, the things which the world looks down upon, despises, and thinks so little of. Those are the signs by which you will know Christ the Lord, the Savior from sin. Why was our Lord Jesus Christ born in such poverty and lowliness? St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. The Son of God leaves his heavenly throne of splendor and glory and eternal majesty, empties himself of all divine prerogative. He's born into the world and lives his life in abject poverty, beginning on this night, so that all who believe in him, so that all who trust his promises, so that all who look with eyes of faith to his atoning death upon the cross for the sins of the world might become rich. Not with gold, not with silver, not with stocks or bonds, not with any of the things of this world that the world counts as wealth and riches, but rich in the superabundance of God's grace and mercy towards sinners, rich in righteousness, innocence, and blessedness before God the Father. All of these things which are yours, not because you are worthy of it, but because Christ has freely earned it for you and gives it to all who trust his merits rather than their own. All he gives these things so that you, though impoverished by sin, may be rich in the things of God. For this is no ordinary child which we celebrate and praise this evening, nor is he given for any ordinary purpose. He was given so that sinners might exchange the poverty of their sin, death, and the thraldom to the devil, that they might exchange the great fear of God's wrath for the great joy of knowing that this Jesus accomplishes what his name says. He saves us from our sins and brings us into the everlasting kingdom to rule over us in righteousness, in innocence, in blessedness, and in great joy. By his poverty, he makes all who believe in him rich, superabundantly rich. For we possess something that we can find nowhere else in all of the world except in the manger and at the cross, the mercy of God and the forgiveness of all of our sins. For in that we exchange great fear for great joy. Amen. And now may the peace of God which far surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.